All right, good morning. So we're going to pick up here with uh, vision today and eye movements. And this is um, often a difficult area of the neurologic examination, the neuroanatomy, so we'll spend um, a little more time over this. All right, so remember we're talking about four different ways we can evaluate the optic nerve. Okay, and kind of went over very briefly visual acuity last time. Remember that central macular vision? Now, visual fields are best done by what's called the confrontation method. So just imagine I have a patient standing right in front of me here. You want to be about two or three feet away from the patient. Okay, and so it's very important we want the patient to be looking at your nose when you do that. So we're lined up with the patient. Okay, and then we're going to ask the patient to cover one eye, and you're going to cover the corresponding eye. And with the patient looking at your nose, you're just going to hold up your hand like this with your palm towards the patient, and we'll hold up fingers. And we do that in all four quadrants, which will make sense here in just a little bit. So we check one eye, and we have the patient cover the other eye. You cover the same eye, and then we do the same thing in the opposite eye. And it's hard for patients. They want to look at your hand, so they want to look out there. And you say, don't keep looking at my nose, okay? Because, again, you'll, you'll understand why that's important here in just a little bit. So notice here that um, what's really important when we think about vision hitting the eye, we want to think, okay, as, as vision is coming in, as the patient's looking straight ahead, is it going to strike the nasal retina like this? Or is it going to strike the temporal retina? Okay, so if we're just thinking about the right eye, vision out here is going to strike the nasal retina. Vision over here is going to strike the temporal retina. Okay, so let's just imagine here this is the left, this is the right. doesn't matter, but we could switch that around. And so notice that vision out here in blue, as it comes in, the patient's looking straight ahead. Vision off to this side is going to strike the temporal retina in this eye, the nasal retina in this eye. Okay, and the opposite, of course, for vision coming from the other direction. All right, so we have vision going back here through the optic nerve from the temporal retina and the nasal retina here on both sides. And notice here that at the optic chiasm, that vision coming from the nasal retina, which remember the nasal retina is going to see the outer visual fields on both sides, that that crosses right here. So follow the nasal retina, that's going to cross over. Follow the nasal retinal vision here, that crosses over. So the net result is that once we're behind the optic chiasm, all vision off to one side has crossed to the opposite side, right? Because notice all of this is now blue here in the optic tract, okay? So if this is the left eye, all of the vision, once we get behind the chiasm, is going to be from the contralateral visual field, all right? And so we can follow that vision from the optic tract to the lateral geniculate body here, and then through the optic radiations, going back to the occipital lobe, but it's all crossed once we get behind the optic chiasm. So any lesion that we're going to put once we get posterior to the optic chiasm, and th there are a variety of different visual problems that can occur, but they're all going to happen in the opposite visual field. Okay, let me just stop there and just see if you have any questions about that. Okay, now when we go through and we talk about specific lesions, it'll be kind of an opportunity to uh, reinforce that. Now the first one here is pretty obvious. If we have a lesion here of the optic nerve, then the patient is just going to be blind in that eye, right? Or have a severe visual loss in that eye because now they're not seeing anything on either side of vision, all right? So a lesion here of the optic nerve which we call a prechiasmal lesion. It's in front of the optic chiasm. All right, so oops, here we're looking at the undersurface, so this is the left eye and this is the right eye. But if we have a lesion of the optic nerve or in the eyeball itself, then that's the eye that's going to be affected. So we call that monocular visual loss. 
Okay, so if someone comes in blind in one eye, um, don't be thinking the problem is going to be back here in the brain. Okay, the lesion has to be anterior to the chiasm, so that's either optic nerve or eyeball. Now, if we have a lesion here at the optic chiasm, then we get this distinctive visual field problem, which is a, it's the outer visual field that's lost because remember the, um, if we look here, information from the nasal retina crosses in the optic chiasm, right? So if we have an optic chiasm lesion, that's gonna affect what the nasal retina sees. And what does the nasal retina see? It's, it sees the outer visual fields or the temporal visual fields, all right? And so a lesion here at the optic chiasm then results in this kind of a deficit. And patients with lesions here may say, you know, it's, I feel like I have tunnel vision. It's like everything is kind of constricted down. And that's because they've lost their outer visual fields. So we call that a temporal or a bitemporal, really, because it's both sides. It's bitemporal visual fields, hemianopia. Hemi is half, opia is the visual loss. And sometimes it's called hemianopsia. It means the same thing, hemianopia. All right, so what would cause that? Well, um, I'll show you a picture in just a little bit, but remember when we were talking about the hypothalamus, and I said there are several landmarks around the hypothalamus, and one of them is the optic chiasm, which is right there. So the optic chiasm is right in that location. What is right underneath the hypothalamus? It's the pituitary. So a pituitary tumor will often compress right on the optic chiasm. That would probably be the most common lesion that would affect the optic chiasm. Yes? They're le they're we usually say the temporal, the outer yeah. visual field. Um, so I put the lesion precisely here where the line is. So the fibers here from the temporal retina are unaffected. No, follow the temporal retina here, it's unaffected. Follow the temporal retina here, it's unaffected. So if we put the lesion right in the middle of the chiasm, the temporal retinal vision gets by without any problem. Right, the black is the visual loss. Yeah, right. Just like here, when we said monocular vision loss in the left eye, this is kind of what the patient sees. They see, you know, black. Okay, so that's a real high yield, very common board question. It's not that we see it that often, but it's just a good way to test, uh, you know, do you understand these uh, visual pathways? Now, as we move back, remember, once we get behind the chiasm, all vision is crossed over, okay? So our lesion here is in the right optic tract, all right, and so the patient, the visual loss is going to have to be um, in the left visual field, okay? And so this is, you kind of have to imagine now that uh, the, the patient is uh, looking at the screen here, okay? And so what do they see in the left eye and in the right eye? Well, they've lost vision off to the left side in both eyes, okay? And so a distinctive thing about an optic tract and also a lateral geniculate body lesion is that the visual pathways in this area, they're in rotation. And so lesions there tend not to produce visual field loss that is perfectly symmetrical from side to side. And we call that incongruous. And it could take on a variety of patterns, but when we're mapping out the visual loss someone has, and it's, you know, it's off to one side, but it's unequal, then that, makes us think of a lesion here of the optic tract or of the lateral geniculate body. So again, the lesion's on the right, and so as the patient looks at the screen, their visual loss is, everything is off to the left side. Yes? Say just a little louder. You want, you want me to do this one again? <laughs> 
Okay, so if we have a lesion here, then you'll notice all of the visual loss with in both eyes is going to be off to the opposite side, right? So if the lesion is here on this side, we've got visual loss um, on the opposite field in both eyes. Right here? Well, it doesn't matter which eye we're talking about, but we use it. Okay. If we have a lesion in the optic nerve. Okay, optic tract. Okay, so if we have an optic tract lesion, notice it's going to affect the temporal retina in this eye because that crosses over and the nasal retina in this eye. So then you need to ask yourself, okay, what does the temporal retina see in this eye? It sees over here. What does the nasal retina see in this eye? It sees over here. Right? So the visual loss is going to be on the opposite side in both eyes. Yeah. And this does take a little while. I would just suggest, uh, and it's the case with a lot of, there's one thing I like about neuroscience is if you get to the point where you can draw this out yourself, You'll forget a lot of the details, but you can figure it out if you can just draw things out, right? It's less of a memory work um, kind of a thing. Yes, question in the back. Um, don't worry about exactly what's happening here, why one is affected more than the other, because this could take a variety of different patterns. What I really just want you to know is if we've got that lesion just behind the optic chiasm, lateral geniculate body, because of the rotation of the fibers, the visual field loss is not perfectly symmetrical. Because what happens, what we'll see is the further you, be go, you go back to the occipital lobe, the more perfectly identical the visual field loss is in both eyes. Okay, so that's the more important thing. Um, yeah, so your question is a good one, but it's just way too complicated to you know, spend 10 minutes um, going into it, and I don't think it's that important. Okay, I read through all of these handouts very carefully this year, and I just noticed I missed that I said we'll talk about a stroke lateral geniculate next year. Well, that was when we had two neuroscience courses, so sorry, I missed that one. But we will, in the stroke lecture, spend a lot more time talking about stroke here and uh, the visual loss that goes along with that. Now, if we put the lesion, so after the lateral geniculate, we have these optic radiations that go back to the occipital lobe, and these fan out. Some of them go through, less of them go through the temporal lobe. We call that Meyer's loop of the optic radiations. Most, more of them go through the parietal lobe, okay? And so um, if we put the lesion here on the left side, now, just as a big picture, we're behind the chiasm, right? So whatever visual field loss the patient's going to have, it's going to be on the opposite visual field. We, we at least know that much, okay? And the temporal lobe optic radiations see a little pie in the sky in the upper quadrant in both eyes, okay? And so a lesion here in the temporal lobe results in this very distinctive pattern of visual loss, and we call this a homonymous meaning it's equal from side to side, superior, it's a superior field of visual loss, quadrantinopia, which means it's a quadrant that is lost. And this, very sorry this is in here, this is congruent, right? It's perfectly symmetrical from side to side, and so just cross out the IN, okay? It's congruent. So notice, once we get here back into the optic radiations, occipital lobe, the visual uh, loss tends to be equal from side to side. So congruent, not incongruent. And so this pie in the sky lesion, again, another really high yield, common, I think, board questions. If you see that, the lesion's in the temporal lobe, the opposite temporal lobe. Okay, and later on, Dr. Kirby will give you a lecture on neuro-ophthalmology. And I feel comfortable telling you, you this because he tells every class that he had a tumor that actually affected this pathway, and he has that pie-in-the-sky visual field loss. 
Now, if we have a parietal lobe lesion here in six, so again, the lesion's on the left, so as the patient looks at the screen, their visual loss is going to be off to the right. The parietal lobe gets everything else in the opposite space, all right? So it's the mirror of the, so the pie in the sky is up here, but the parietal lobe gets everything else. So now we have a homonymous hemianopia. It's equal from side to side, and it's much larger in the inferior portion. Yes? I, I couldn't hear the last part of what you said. So the lesion is on the left, and remember, any th once we get behind the chiasm, wherever whether we're talking about optic tract, lateral geniculate, optic radiations, occipital lobe, the visual loss can only be on the opposite side because all vision is crossed over. Um, all the vision from the opposite side is crossed over. So um, whatever we're going to have, it's going to have to any lesion here is going to have to produce visual loss on this side. And so it just turns out that the temporal lobe fibers, there are fewer of them, and those are the ones that see kind of the upper quadrant on the opposite side. All right, now if we have a larger lesion that destroys all of the optic tracts, and this is probably one of the most common ones that we see, this is a middle cerebral artery stroke. The middle cerebral artery supplies all of the optic radiation. So if we have an MCA stroke, more posterior, we knock them all out, okay? And so here we have our lesion, and so the patient is gonna have a contralateral homonymous. This may not look equal from side to side, but um, it is, <laughs> all right? Uh, hemianopia, so they're all destroyed. And um, I'm always, a bit annoyed, almost every review book I've seen for neuroscience, when they show you this, they usually put the lesion in the optic tract. Um, but really, in the real world, it's incongruous in the optic tract, like I showed you. Yeah, if you were to completely cut the optic tract entirely, which would be really rare, then you would get exactly this, if you destroyed everything. Okay, but lesions in neurology don't tend to be 100%. And so if you see something like this, a complete contralateral visual field loss, then that's a complete lesion of the optic radiations. Okay, so we'll see that when we talk about MCA stroke. Now back in the occipital lobe, remember the posterior cerebral artery goes back to supply the occipital lobe. And so if we have a posterior cerebral artery stroke that affects the occipital lobe, then we get something that looks like this. Notice it looks just like an optic radiation lesions, but you've got this central area of spared vision. Okay, so again, the lesion's on the right, so we're behind the chiasm, so the visual field loss has to be to the left, so as the patient's looking at the screen, that all fits. Visual loss is off to the left. But this is called macular sparing. And this is, remember I said the macula supplies central vision. And the macular fibers are spared with a posterior cerebral artery stroke. And the reason is the macular fibers uh, back in the occipital lobe get a dual blood supply. They're supplied by the MCA and the PCA. So we have a PCA stroke, but the MCA still supplies the macular fibers back in the occipital lobe. So that is called macular sparing. And this is, requires some time uh, if you're doing the neurologic examination. If you're just having the patient count fingers, they're not gonna count fingers off to this side. And what we actually have to do is take a little, like a pin with a red tip and you kind of go back and forth. Do you see it now? Do you see it now? We go back and forth and it goes right down the midline until we get to this central area and then they have this spared vision like that right around the center. So that's what we mean by macular sparing. Okay, so if you see that, and all of these are just some of the highest yield board questions, I would say they love to ask these. And so if you see macular sparing, just it's PCA stroke, right? And then you just need to know, is it right or left? All right, any questions, more questions about visual field? 
best thing always with this is can you draw it out on your own? Can you map out, you know, and once you can do that, then you know you understand it. All right, so um, next thing we can do to evaluate optic nerve function is the ophthalmoscopic exam, which I won't say much about because Dr. Schenkel has such a long time with you um, on this. So here we have a nice normal exam. You know, we can look at the optic disc and blood vessels and the macula. Um, and here we have uh, what's called papilledema. And so this is when we have increased intracranial pressure. There's nowhere for that pressure to go in the brain. I mean, it's encased by skull. And so when we have increased pressure, one of the ways it, it tends to push out is towards the optic nerve head. And that results in swelling, congestion around the optic nerve head. So this is abnormal. Okay, I'm not gonna show you pictures of this because it's Dr. Shankel's area. I just kinda wanna give you some ideas of what we can look for. We also look for something called optic nerve pallor. And can you see this is a very white appearing optic disc compared to the normal over here. And this is where we have atrophy of the optic nerve and it takes on a uh, bright uh, kind of appearance. Okay, so this is a very helpful part of the neurologic examination. It's very difficult. Uh, really, it took me um, six months into a neurology residency before I felt really comfortable um, looking at the optic nerve and knowing what I was seeing. And if no one's told you this, okay, so this is what I expected as a medical student. All right, I'm gonna look in the eye. This is what I'm gonna see. <laughs> and the reality is when you look in the eye, this is your window of what you see. Right, and so what you have to do is, you know, try to find a blood vessel. All right, let's map that, let's follow that to the optic disc, and it's a lot of work, okay? Have you been told that so far? So you knew that, okay. Now let's talk about, finally, the pupil. So this is our fourth way to evaluate the optic nerve, and the pupillary light reflex is a reflex that involves cranial nerves two and three, okay? And so, when we talk about the pupil, we want to think about sympathetics and parasympathetics. There's two opposing forces here. The sympathetics always want to act to dilate the pupil. Okay, remember fight or flight, your pupil's going to dilate, right? You want to get all the light in. So this is sympathetics. Parasympathetics want to constrict the pupil. Okay, so when we talk about lesions, we can imagine then that a sympathetic lesion, the pupil can't dilate, right? So we have more parasympathetics, the pupil's going to be smaller than it should be. Okay, and the opposite, uh, if we have a, a parasympathetic lesion where now the sympathetics are unopposed and the pupil is going to be very large. All right, so here's the normal pupillary light reflex. We shine the light in the eye. All right, so it's going to travel down the optic nerves. Okay, some will stay on the same side. Some will cross over at the chiasm. We're not talking about you know, visual acuity here or visual field. This is just light that's flooding the optic nerves. So some's gonna stay on the same side, some's gonna cross over, all right? So if we follow the light here coming from the optic tract, it goes back to an area, remember we called this the tectum back here? And there's a nucleus uh, called the pretectal nucleus. It's right next to the superior colliculus. And this is kind of the first relay step for light. Notice if we follow light crossing over the optic chiasm over here, well, it innervates the pretectal nucleus on this side. <coughs> okay, well, there's another crossing, actually, of light, which is labeled in your handout, and it was lost here in this slide, but this right here is the posterior commissure. Okay, so light, as it's going back to the midbrain, crosses at the optic chiasm, crosses again at the posterior commissure, and so the net result is then that uh, the, the parasympathetic fibers to constrict your pupil travel with the third nerve. Okay, and when we go through the brain stem in detail, we'll, we'll have a chance to look at this nucleus. But the part of the third nerve nucleus, the parasympathetic contribution to the third nerve nucleus is this nucleus here called the Edinger-Westfall nucleus. Okay, very important nucleus. So again, we want to associate that with the pupil. So light in one eye then is going to perfectly, equally symmetrically stimulate both Edinger-Westfall nuclei. And so the output then will be perfectly symmetrical via both, both cranial nerves through the ciliary ganglion and then out 
to constrict both pupils. So the, in the pupillary light reflex then, when you shine the light in one eye, if we have normal anatomy here, both pupils will equally perfectly constrict, both eyes. All right, so that's parasympathetics. So here's the posterior commissure. And you could argue how really important is the posterior commissure since, you know, we have a crossing at the optic chiasm as well. And um, I don't know, it's, it's involved in pupillary constriction of light. It's part of that double redundancy, really, of light getting to both at intra-westfall nuclei. So our pupils can constrict to light, but they also constrict to what we call accommodation. Accommodation is just looking at your nose. And so we'll test this on exam, look at my finger and follow it to your nose. And when you do that, the pupils constrict a little bit, not usually quite as much as they do to light. And so this is uh, really showing you the same thing, but with different orientation. Now the midbrain is flipped around this way, but if we shine the light in this eye, this is only showing you what's happening along the half of the midbrain. The light goes back through the optic chiasm. It stimulates the intra-westfall nuclei. This is not showing you, you know, the crossing fibers. And it goes out here via the intra-westfall nucleus through the ciliary ganglion to constrict the pupil. And again, the same thing is happening over here. It's just not drawn. Now, accommodation, looking to your nose, um, you know, that requires some tracking, right? You're following the finger to your nose. And so that's your occipital lobe, your visual cortex, helping you look at an object and track it, okay? And so this is coming from the occipital lobe here, which notice has a connection with the pretectal area as well that will then stimulate the edinger westfall nuclei. And that's why our pupils constrict when we look to the nose. It's a separate pathway though than light stimulation. Okay, and so later on in the course, we will talk about lesions that tend to involve this area back here that will then impair the ability of the pupils to constrict to light, but that they do constrict to accommodation because the connection to the pretectal area is different when it comes from the occipital lobe. And so, um, again, we'll spend a lot more time on this. It's called the Argyle Robertson pupil, where the pupil does not constrict to light, but yet it does constrict to accommodation. And so there are several conditions, probably the one that boards most often ask you about is neurosyphilis lesion here where the pupils don't constrict to light. So we'll explain that in, in more detail later. All right, so that's how the parasympathetics constrict your pupil. This is how the sympathetics dilate your pupil. And this is an amazingly complex pathway Okay, that starts all the way up here in the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is the head ganglion for the autonomic nervous system. And so the, the pathway that uh, dilates your pupil is a three-order neuron pathway. The first step goes from the hypothalamus down to the cervical spinal cord. This is headed for the pupil. Okay, why is it going all the way down there? It's just the way it is. But it goes down to C8, T1, T2. Okay, these neurons here. And very importantly, it goes through the lateral medulla. Remember I told you probably the single most asked board question for neuroscience is a lateral medullary lesion for whatever reason. So you want to know everything that's in the lateral medulla. Well, one thing that's there are the first order sympathetics to dilate your pupil. So it synapses here. The next order neuron, it has kind of a long route. It goes around the, over the apex of the lung, around the subclavian artery, and it synapses on the superior cervical ganglion. Okay, from the superior cervical ganglion, these um, sympathetic fibers that go to blood vessels and sweat glands kind of head off with the external carotid artery for the face. All right, and for the pupil, and the uh, eyelid, these head up along the internal carotid artery, okay? And I don't really care that you know all of the details here. What I want you to know is that these fibers from the superior cervical ganglion end up going to the pupil dilator muscle to dilate your pupil. And they also supply a muscle that is a minor eyelid elevator. It's called Mueller's muscle. It's not the major eyelid ele elevator, it's a minor eyelid elevator. 
Okay, so the action is to dilate your pupil and to facilitate lifting your eyelid up a little bit. All right, so a lesion here, anywhere, first order neuron, second order neuron, third order neuron, can all produce what we call Horner's syndrome. And it's all a, a deficiency of sympathetic control of the pupil to dilate the pupil. And so here we have a patient with a right Horner's syndrome. And notice the pupil is a bit smaller and the eyelid is a little droopy. Okay, all the patients I've seen with Horner's syndrome are more subtle than this. This is really obvious here, but the pupil, um, you know, you wonder, is this real or not? You know, the eyelid, is it really droopy or not? But anyway, we can make it really obvious here. There's a very dramatic corner syndrome. Now, when you see someone like this with pupillary asymmetry, because it's about one in five individuals that have some pupillary asymmetry. If we were just to go through with everyone in this room, we'd find a lot of people that have slightly asymmetrical pupils. That's really common. And so if we want to find out, is this real or not? Is this just benign, normal, um, this is called anisocoria, unequal pupils. Is it normal anisocoria or is this a significant, you know, like Horner syndrome? Then the quickest thing to do is just turn the room lights off. Now you still need to have enough light to see the pupils, but it just dim the room lights, okay? Because what happens when if in normal individuals, if you dim the loom, room lights, the pupils dilate, right? That's the normal response. So here's the normal eye. You dim, dim the room lights, that pupil enlarges. Okay, but this eye is not getting sympathetic innervation, so the pupil doesn't dilate. And so this now convinces us, okay, this is real. Right now we've got a very dramatic pupillary asymmetry. And so just, again, something you can do in seconds that'll help to tell you whether this is a significant lesion. So if we have, if we see this, now we know we're dealing with a Horner syndrome and we need to figure out, okay, is it a first order lesion? Is it a second order lesion or is it a third order lesion? So first order lesions, we'll talk about lateral medullary syndrome in a lot of detail, spend a long time on that. But the most common board question, even though I told you lateral medullary is so common, uh, is a lesion here. If a patient has an apical lung tumor, then because the sympathetics are right adjacent, that would be a common location. So if we see a smoker that has this findings, well, we're very concerned this patient has cancer. Okay, we need to do a chest X-ray or chest CT. All right, so this would be a second order lesion. If we have trauma to the carotid artery, like someone's in a car accident, a patient I saw not too long ago, the seatbelt went across the carotid artery and uh, that involved the sympathetics here. Okay, so that would obviously be something very concerning. We need to figure out what's going on. Now, one thing we can say about a third order neuron lesion, if we have a lesion of the carotid, that's gonna affect the pupil, it's gonna affect the Mueller's muscle, but it's not gonna affect the fibers going out here with blood vessels and sweat glands. Okay, those will not be affected. So that's one, one way we can uh, kind of distinguish here with a third order neuron lesion here, then we're not gonna have that lack of supply to blood vessels and sweat glands. So the three things, the triad that's part of Horner syndrome is meiosis, which means a smaller pupil, Ptosis, okay, you don't pronounce the P, ptosis, which is the droopy eyelid from involvement of Mueller's muscles. And uh, anhydrosis is a lack of sweating on the face, which can be kind of difficult really to assess uh, in the real world. And that's called anhydrosis. And so if we have all three of these, then it becomes, you know, we know we're dealing with a first or second order uh, neuron lesion. Okay, so again, another picture here showing you a patient with uh, Horner syndrome. And so a first order lesion, we'll, when we talk about strokes, especially lateral medullary syndrome, we'll go over this, but remember these fibers also have to go through the cervical cord. So if we had a significant cervical cord lesion, you could have a Horner syndrome. Second order lesion, common board question, apical lung tumor. Third order neuron lesion, is trauma to the carotid artery, which can cause what's called a dissection, where the blood 
dissects into the wall of the carotid artery. And because of that pressure, the carotid artery gets bigger and bigger, and then it's going to compress those sympathetic fibers. And we'll see there even are some headache syndromes that um, during the headache, the patient may have uh, what appears to be a Horner's syndrome. Some headache syndromes can cause some s dilation of the carotid artery, so it'll affect those sympathetics. All right, any questions on the pupils? All right, then let's move on and talk about eye movements. So three, four, and six are the cranial nerves that supply eye movements. Here's a medical student, just did a real nice drawing here showing you the different cranial nerve nuclei. Uh, the, we've appreciated the trochlear nerve here, exits the dorsum of the brainstem, has a really long course to supply the superior oblique. The abducens supplies the lateral rectus. And the oculomotor nucleus, the oculomotor nerve, supplies everything else. Okay, so uh, the way that I think most people remember this initially is SO4 LR6. Fourth nerve gets the superior, superior oblique. The sixth nerve gets the lateral rectus, and the third nerve supplies all of the other uh, extraocular muscles. Okay, so the way we usually check eye movements is just by just having the patient follow our finger in an H-like pattern. Okay, so they make an H, and by doing that, you actually assess all of these individual muscles, and therefore the three cranial nerves um, that are involved. So the medial lateral rectus muscles are easy, those are horizontal. So medial rectus allows you to look to the nose, lateral rectus allows you to look out. Okay, and so looking to the nose, we call that adduction. Looking out is abduction, abduction. Okay, and we can see here that when the eye is in the abducted position, the superior rectus elevates, the inferior rectus depresses. When the eye is looking towards the nose, inferior oblique acts mainly to elevate and the superior oblique to depress the eye. And I forgot to ask, uh, is this wh what you were taught in anatomy? Hopefully. Good. Okay, sometimes there's some confusion um, about this. There's just another picture showing you the eye muscles. So I had a student draw this if you mainly to show you the superior oblique, because that is usually the one where there's some confusion um, in previous years. So we're, when you're looking at the superior muscles here, pretend you're looking on top of the eyeball. Okay, so for the superior oblique, we can see the muscle here. And so the strongest action of all of these muscles is when the muscle is stretched and when, the, when it's the movement is in the vector of the muscle. And so notice, looking on top of the right eyeball here, that when the eye is looking towards the nose, okay, this muscle gets very tight and the action is in the direction of the muscle. And so that's why the strongest action of the superior oblique is when you're, if you were talking about my right eye, when I'm looking this way, it acts very strong to depress. When I look down, that is the superior oblique, down and towards the nose. The further, uh, again, if we're talking about my right eye, the further I am abducting, then the superior oblique goes from as a depression action to more of this kind of motion. And we call that encyclotorsion. It's a twisting movement. But again, it's going down and towards the nose but when, when my eye is looking towards the nose, it purely depresses. As it goes further out, it starts to do this action. Okay, so we can think about then what would happen. Let's talk with the third nerve palsy. Um, what's going to happen in the third nerve palsy? So remember then, in this case, the right eye is affected, obviously. And so all the eye muscles are affected except for two the lateral rectus, because that's sixth nerve, and the superior oblique, which is fourth nerve. And so um, when I show you these pictures, um, the center one is just what we call primary gaze. The patient is trying to look straight ahead. Okay, and so the patient is just looking at you here with the third nerve palsy. Um, 
the lateral rectus, which is intact, right, pulls the eye out. It's unopposed now by the medial rectus. The medial rectus is supplied by the third nerve. So the eye gets pulled out. And notice that when the patient tries to look here to the left, well, the medial rectus isn't working at all. So this eye just gets stuck in that position. It can't move towards the nose. And when the patient tries to look up, this eye can't cooperate. When it tries to look down, nothing happens. When the patient tries to look up, again, the, the left eye here is normal. This eye can't look up. It can't depress normally. But notice when the patient now tries to look to the right, the lateral rectus sixth nerve is intact. So now the eye actually does you know, pretty good. It can, it can move out normally pretty well when the patient is trying to look towards the right. Okay, what isn't shown here, and if, if you want to look, I have a video showing you this, but in the third nerve palsy, if you wanted to check the function of the fourth nerve, okay, remember when the eye is in this position, this abducted position, that's when the fourth nerve acts to do this, to encyclotort. And so when the patient is now looking to the left, this eye actually is doing this. It's kind of, it's not moving towards the nose, but it's making a little twisting movement like that. And that tells us the fourth nerve is still working. Now notice one other thing about the um, pupil in this case, right? That um, the, the parasympathetics I just showed you from edinger westphal nucleus travel with the third nerve. And so if we have a third nerve palsy, usually we're going to see uh, pupillary dilation. And that's called mydriasis. Remember, meiosis with Horner syndrome is the pupil's too small. Mydriasis, the pupil is too large. All right. Notice also that the eyelid is lower here. And so the third nerve um, is the major cranial nerve that elevates your eyelid. And so we're going to get a mo much more severe ptosis uh, when we have a third nerve palsy, much more severe than we see with the Horner syndrome. In fact, usually the eyelids close completely, but I didn't have the student draw it that way because I wanted you to see what the eye was doing. You normally have to lift up the eyelid just to see uh, what's happening with the eye. Okay, so um, I've told you about two causes of third nerve palsy so far. Remember uncle herniation because the uncle sits right next to the third nerve. And then we talked about a posterior communicating artery aneurysm because the third nerve is very close to that. Okay, I won't ask you about these for now, but these are the other three if you want to write them down now so that when we come to them later, kind of this planned redundancy, these are the other three causes. So at the end of the course, you'll know five causes of a third nerve palsy. All right, so um, I'm just going to 